Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I am honored to be joined by Dr. Doug Mader in today's episode, and I'm also joined by Dr. Kelsey Chapman, who helped co-host this episode. Many of you are familiar with Kelsey. She's been on the podcast a couple of times, and I felt like having Dr. Doug Mader on, I really needed a secondary person to help me facilitate some of that vet conversation. There's a lot of drugs that we end up using because of anecdotal and personal information and experience that we keep using. There's an antibiotic called ceftazidine that we use a lot in reptiles as well, and there are actually very few what are called PKPD studies. Studies, so pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic studies that look at where the drug goes in the body to which tissues where it concentrates in and how it kind of works just to bring up a point there's a, a medication called convenia which is um sofobacin. do you have that in canada we do yes it's a long-acting drug that they use in dogs and cats and it's an antibiotic and one injection for instance in a cat can last 10 to 12 days so you would think wow if it lasts 10 to 12 days in a cat it's going to have to last a month in a reptile right <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, they've given it to iguanas, and Dylan, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but take a guess how long you think it lasts. In this episode, we discuss Doug's history with reptile vet med, how it has evolved over the uh, years. I mean, when I first got started, it was right around the early 80s, and there were only like three books that had been published on reptile medicine, and all of them were pretty small. Of I mean, course, we very- discussed the genesis of the famous Mater's Reptile and Amphibian Medicine and Surgery and textbook. My- new book and he goes how would you like to write a chapter on drugs drug therapy and reptiles for me and i'm like oh my god really you want me to write a chapter for you and he said yes i would love it and now all of a sudden i had a reputation like overnight and we also discussed dr mater's most recent book the vet at noah's ark i really enjoyed this conversation and i know you will as well here's my conversation with dr doug mater and dr kelsey chapman all right well doug welcome to the podcast thank you so much for doing this Oh, um, it's such an honor and a pleasure. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Dylan. And thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, I think you, your name is a, one of probably, I don't know, the top five or top 10 names that is very recognizable for reptile keepers, especially those who are, you know, not the, the I bought a, a ball python for my birthday, but those who are really pushing to advance their care and trying to get down to the nitty gritty of how we can properly care for animals. And But I, but I also think that your last name Mater, people just think that's the name of a textbook because <laughs> they don't realize it, you know, it's named after somebody and it's the work that you've done and, and how influential you've been over time. Um, I would love to set a foundation for people to kind of give people your background and, and uh, by way that'll also give us uh, your immense experience over the years. So let's just start with why did you get into vet med originally? What, what made you pursue that path? Well, that's a, it's a fun, fun story. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I was born in the Florida Keys, which is a little archipelago on the very south tip of the peninsula of the mainland Florida. And my parents had a third house that was built on the small island where I was born. And our house was surrounded by mangrove swamps. So long story short, uh, but you're going to hear it anyway. It, uh, my older brother would take me out in the mangroves and we would slosh through the swamps and catch snakes and frogs and bugs and all sorts of fun stuff. And that's kind of how I got my initial love for the exotics and the creepy crawlies. Uh, my father was in the military and Uncle Sam sent him off to Vietnam. And so when he was transferred to Vietnam, our family then was transferred to the state of Hawaii, where there was a military base where a lot of the military families lived. And so I, I kind of grew up there. And as I was growing up, you know, of course, being on in Hawaii, I was a beach boy and surfing and everything else. My older sister loved horses. And so she had horses at the stables and the rules of the stables required that the father of whoever the people were that had horses attain, uh, um, go to a work day once a month for four hours and repair fences and fix things up. Well, my father was off fighting a war. So my mother made me the brother, you, know, you go out and you do the work of dad. So I would go to the stables and I would start taking care of all the work that had to be done. And then I noticed when I was out the stables, you know, man, there's a lot of cute girls out here. Keep in mind, I'm in high school, right? So, <laughs> so I go, there's a lot of cute girls out here. And it's just it's kind of cool. So then I noticed that none of the girls looked at me. They were all looking at the village blacksmith. There was a young guy just a couple years older than I was. He was all muscular and sweaty. And the girls would always bring sodas to him and just drool over him and, you know, he, would, he was the guy. He was the main person. And I go, you know, I can do that. So when I was 15, I moved away and I went to blacksmithing school. 
got my uh, farrier certificate, moved back and started my own business and started chewing horses. And it was really cool. Backbreaking work, but I loved it. And back then I was making pretty good money considering, uh, you know, what the, co at the cost of living or the hourly wage was a buck quarter an hour back then. Gives you an idea how long ago it was. <laughs> so then as I was shoeing horses, uh, the veterinarian would come out and he would take care of these horses. And he'd always come to me when he'd have a horse that was lame and he'd say, hey, Doug, can you make me this shoe or can you fix this foot? And I started working with him and I go, this is really cool. You know, I, I can take my skill sets and I can make these horses better and horses that were bound to the glue factory. I could fix their feet, put them back into service and make them happy, healthy, strong horses again. And then I go, you know what? I don't need to break my back shoeing horses the rest of my life. I can become a veterinarian too. Mm. And I love to read. And so the veterinarian gave me a copy of the James Harriet book, all creatures great and small. I'm sure you've heard of that. Uh, he's like, he was a British veterinarian that wrote a series of four amazing books back in the seventies. And he talked all about being a veterinarian in the countryside of England. And I, I read the book and then I read the book and then I read it again. And then I found out he wrote other books. I read all those and I said that that sealed the deal. I want to go to veterinary school and I want to be a horse doctor. And so, Oh, and by the way, keep in mind growing up in Hawaii there, there's only one snake. Uh, and it's called the Hawaiian blind snake. Nobody's ever seen it. I saw one the entire time I lived there. And everybody thought I was Lolo, which is Hawaiian for crazy. So I was kind of devoid of reptiles when I lived in Hawaii, but I always still had a passion for them because I learned about that in the swamps. Um, so anyway, so I moved off. I went to veterinary school and my whole goal was to be an equine doctor. Um, although the entire time I was in school, I kept snakes in the dorm room because I've always loved snakes. And as soon as I got back to California, you know, you're allowed to have snakes. Um, and then one night, uh, uh, underage drunken driver was drag racing his friend and lost control and ran me over at 120 miles an hour. So a year and like 17 surgeries later, um, I realized I couldn't work with horses anymore. So I started volunteering at the zoo ward and that's how I kind of transitioned into the exotics. And then my passion for the creepy crawlies just kind of came to fruition. So I combined my medicine knowledge and my, my love for exotics and especially snakes and turtles and lizards. And that's where I am today. Wow. I would never have guessed that a, it was a, a getting run over by a car that got you into <laughs> keeping exotics. I do find that there's actually, and I guess, Kelsey, you might experience this as well. There's quite an overlap of people who are passionate about horses and reptiles. I don't know what it is. I, like, I don't know if there's if it's a common thing, but Kelsey, you have horse a horse as well, I think. I did. I, I actually, I sold him a couple of years ago just because mm. vet life is busy, as we all know. And I was used to growing up with horses in a way where I would train them and spend all my time with them. So it was hard to just have a casual horse. But I, I mean, my story is not the exact same, but I went into vet school assuming I would do horses or I would do at least large animal or rural practice. And as I went through vet school, I realized that it wasn't just the horses that I was looking for. It was the variety of species. And I grew up an only child as well. So um, animals were who I talked to when I was younger. Um, and then when I got into, into vet school and went through it, I realized, oh, there's an exotics practice that's in the city. Like, I could do this all the time. This sounds great. So I never really looked back from there, but um, I don't know what the relationship between horses and reptiles are. Maybe it's the danger or the weirdness. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, who knows? Uh, I've heard that before too. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's, it, well, the human animal bond extends across yeah. all species and i think you know the studies that have been done show that dogs cats and horses are like one two and three or some version of that and uh i mean i i ended up did getting a horse of my own um after i started chewing horses and i could afford it and i loved it i mean he was he was my best friend when i was in high school and uh it was the saddest day of my life when i had to sell him and move off to college so i mean they're they're pretty amazing animals mm, they yeah they, they definitely are so i'm curious that I'm curious about the state of reptile medicine when you began practicing exotics, because we've seen such a steep change in it over even the last 20 years, I think. And obviously, Kelsey have recently, more recently gone through exotics vet school. But even then, I think things have changed probably since you've graduated. So, Doug, what was it like when you initially started practicing exotics, just as far as how much knowledge was around about treating these things that, you know, had Kelsey had mentioned, there's such a vast variety of species, it's almost impossible to have enough information. And I imagine back then it was even more difficult. Oh, sure. Um, I mean, when I first got started, it was right around the early 80s. And 
there were only like three books that had been published on reptile medicine and all of them were pretty small. I mean, very, very scant. There wasn't a lot of knowledge and pretty much everything in the books was anecdotal. I mean, there was just, you know, you didn't open up a page and have uh, 50 references on a particular disease or a type of drug or what kind of lighting to use. It was like, here's what I did in my practice. Here's what I gave in the animal died, or here's what I did in the animal lived. So this must work better than the other thing did. And that's pretty much the way it was. Um, so, and even at the time, um, the school I went to, UC Davis, and I think maybe one other school in the country had an actual exotics program. And most of the other schools didn't have anything at all, or they might teach one or two classes a year kind of on general exotics. But there, there wasn't a whole lot, especially with reptiles. I mean, the zoo world was was in pretty much in full swing and doing quite well. Um but, you know, they, they mostly managed themselves around back then around the megavertebrates and the larger, larger mammals um, and reptiles were just a small, small part of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's I think back and I had I was fortunate enough. Um, many people, unfortunately, don't remember the name Fred Fry, but I consider him the grandfather of reptile medicine. And he wrote the first book on reptiles, reptile medicine. And I actually met him by accident. I was. At that time, I, I always shudder to say this because people look at me with a bad eye, but my buddy and I had 67 pythons and we were raising pythons and selling them in the pet trade. And back then, pythons were cool. Now, you know, you think about pythons, you think about the Everglades and all the devastation they're doing. I don't know if any of my progeny are out there causing trouble or not. But uh, anyway, so I, I was raising pythons with my buddy to help pay for school as long as my black, as well as my blacksmithing work. And um, I was in a bookstore one day looking at reptile books and this very tall, distinguished gentleman came walking in and he started looking at reptile books. And next to me started talking to each other about reptiles. And I had mentioned that I had all these pythons and he got real interested. He goes, wow, I would really love to see those. And I said, sure. So I invited him over to, to my place where I kept them. And he came by and visited. We were walking around. I was showing things. His name was Fred. That's all I knew. And then my buddy came down and he walked in kind of big eyed and I was kind of surprised his reaction. And we chatted for a while. And then my friend Fred left and my buddy goes, I didn't know you knew Fred Fry. And I go, who's Fred Fry? And he goes, <laughs> he's the guy who wrote the first reptile book. So, I mean, he was so humble and just the nicest guy in the world. And we became really good friends. And here's the godfather, grandfather of reptile medicine. We became friends. He'd have me over for dinner. He and his wife would cook for me. Um, we would go out on his boat. We'd go snake hunting. Whenever he had cases, I'd go over to his house at night and we would do review cases. So I got a chance to sit one-on-one -on -one with this amazing intellect and get some incredible um, tutelage from one of the best reptile veterinarians in the world. That's wonderful. I feel like this, yeah. this um, herpeticulture society brings together people that just stick together for a long time. I've been on Dylan's podcast. This is my third time now. And we've become friends because of that. And there's several other people I can name as well that I just think, my goodness, it's so from walks of life that seems so different, but in some way we're all ancient in the same way that we like those ancient critters. So I think it's really cool. Yeah, it is. You're right about um, reptiles kind of bond people together that normally wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, I'll share a little vignette with you, which Please. dramatically changed my career. Um, when I was in veterinary school, I mean, I, 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 I'm not one of these students that took out student loans. I always worked. I always had a full-time job on top of going to veterinary school. So I was shoeing horses, working as a waiter. I got a weekend job at the local primate center at UC Davis, helping out with the primates. Now, keep in mind, this was back when the human AIDS was first discovered. It was back in the early 80s. And I was working in a laboratory with a Dr. Preston Marks. And he was the virologist that discovered simian aids. And simian aids is like 97% similar to human aids. And so, and they, they, that was discovered just uh, probably a year or so after human aids. So I was ended up working in his laboratory. And keep in mind, this guy's like a brilliant 
uh, you know, world-class virologist, and I'm just a little peon vet student. So when we'd have our team meetings, you know, I'm sitting in the back and peon vet students don't talk. They just sit in the back and listen, right? And so he was, during one of his seminars one day, he was talking about ways to diagnose simian AIDS and comparing what they knew about human AIDS with the simian AIDS virus and then using the simian AIDS virus as a model to help better diagnose human AIDS viruses. And there's a test, Kelsey would know what it is. Uh, Dylan, you may not have heard of it, but it's called hemagglutination inhibition test. And that's where they take serum from a potentially positive viral carrier and they mix it with different red cells. So it could be pig red cells, chicken red cells, um, fish red cells, uh, rabbit red cells, but they also use rattlesnake red cells. And if they have the virus, it reacts differently with the different types of cells. So where am I going with this? So he was, this virologist was talking to the group of people one day, talking about they had tried chicken, they had tried rabbit, they had tried these other things. And he goes, I just need to get a hold of some fresh rattlesnake cells. And so like, my ears picked <laughs> up and I go, this is my chance, okay? So sheepishly, I kind of raised my hand and it's like, what? You're just a peon vet student. What are you doing raising your hand? And I says, I, I can get you fresh rattlesnake cells. And all of a sudden he goes, you can? And I said, yes, I can. And he goes, how? I says, well, I'll just go up in the mountains and I'll catch you a rattlesnake. I'll draw some blood. I'll let the snake go. I won't hurt it. And then I'll give you the cells. He goes, you can do that? And I said, yeah, I, I can do that. He goes, can I go with you? <laughs> so it was like, it turns out he was a closet snake lover too. Here's this brilliant, brilliant scientist, right? But when it came right down to it, he was a boy at heart. He loved snakes. And so I took him up to the mountains. We went with our snake sticks and our snake tubes, and we caught a bunch of rattlesnakes. And he was blown away that I could comfortably, safely catch a rattlesnake and draw blood. We just did it through tubes. And all of a sudden, we became really good friends. And I, I was his best friend, you know. So here I am, this peon vet student in this amazing man's laboratory who discovered simian AIDS virus, right? And all of a sudden, like, I was his coolest friend. And here it is, what? 40 years later, we're still friends. That's the best part about it. Anyway, so where am I going with this? So when it came, came time to graduate and go into and do your internships and residencies, most veterinarians, I don't know the pathway in Canada, but in the United States, most veterinarians graduate. And then if you want to go on to advanced training, you do an internship for a year. Then you apply and do a residency in a super specialty area. So I had graduated. I wanted to go on and obviously not horses anymore. And um, this professor, this this doctor came to me and he says, hey, I would like you to do a primate residency with me so you can continue on with the research uh, with the, the AIDS virus. And I says, well, I haven't done an internship yet. And he goes, wink, wink. He goes, we'll take care of that. So he got me right in. I graduated from veterinary school. I skipped the internship, went right in to do the primate zoo residency. And that's where I am today. That's how I got my background in exotics. Wow. And it was all because of a rattlesnake. See, this is what the young kids need to tell their moms and dads that don't want them to get a snake. See, look what That's the doors right. that can get opened if you have, you know, you're, you're, it, it, it is true. And I, I completely agree. There's a connection that you can have with people that, uh, that you don't necessarily have because they're, they're a, a weird, you know, they're sort of maligned in society. So if you do find fascination in them, you kind of have this immediate bond. And, and I am curious, do you think that is why there was such a void in medical information when you started was just because so few people are interested. And, and I think that's kind of one of the themes you highlight in your book is people just sometimes don't care about reptiles and they're sort of secondary as far as well, I think, or, or medicine. Okay. Yeah. You're going to have to jump back four decades, but I think, you know, a lot of it was, there was no money in it. Mm, okay. And you know, in order to learn and to publish, you have to do research. And to do research, you have to have funding. Back then, there was nobody that was going to give you money to study reptiles. They weren't important. They were studying AIDS. You know, I mean, that was the big pushback, especially back when I was getting started. Everything, everything was focused around discovering more about the AIDS virus. And so there was just no money in it. So any work that was done was done and published either as case reports. Um, and they were usually very poorly peer-reviewed case reports because who's going to peer-review something when nobody else knows anything about it either, you know? Mm -hmm. So they were either very poorly peer-reviewed case reports or they were maybe like minor residency programs. Uh, for instance, I have a master's degree in pharmacology that I studied uh, a use of a drug called amicacin in snakes. And 
I had to beg, borrow, and steal to get enough money just to run the blood samples because nobody wanted to fund it. But, you know, back at that time, I think there were three or four other studies that were published on using antibiotics in reptiles in general, not just snakes. Now there's dozens and dozens and dozens. But, you know, as we've progressed along, there's a lot more money available, a lot more interest available. And of course, the more people that are interested in it, the more products are available. If there are products that are for sale and people buying those products, that makes money available. So now we have the Association of Zoo, zoo Veterinarians, uh, Avian Veterinarians, Small Mammal Veterinarians, Reptile Veterinarians. We have all of these amazing companies out there. And a lot of them donate or dedicate some of their profits and their funds toward research. And so, whereas before you couldn't find money to do research, now it's more and more available. And of course, the more you publish, the more you're likely you're going to get money to do more research. And then you get some of these experts like Dr. Divers at Georgia, who's got a really excellent program, several interns, several residents. And to do a residency or to get boarded now, you have to publish papers. So yeah, the, uh, it's logarithmically increasing the amount of knowledge that we have compared to where it was four decades ago. Mm -hmm. And with on that note too, as well, I mean, we talked about how it's the, the weird and wild that brings us together in terms of reptiles, but it's also the passion that we have. Like the, if anything, if you're, cause Dylan, you had mentioned, you know, kids talk to your parents about getting reptiles, whatever you have a passion for, I think that always has to be fostered. And that passion comes through in how we all talk about these species how we talk about furthering it in different ways, like with, with you, Dylan, with the Herpeticulture Society and taking care of these animals. And with us on the veterinary side, we know that we need more research there. And just like Doug was saying, there was more, always more dogs and cats as pets. There's always more money in that because there's more interest. But we're now seeing this shift where we understand more that there's benefits to having reptiles as pets and people are seeing that more so you can still have that human animal bond but if you have allergies you don't have to worry about that mm -hmm. if you need to go away for a little while or you travel a little more maybe a snake is a good option for you it's that it i can feel it now like the passion is coming out and the more popularity that we have with these pets the better that's going to be and the better their care is going to be in the long term yeah yeah that, absolutely that's so true and i also would like to add i think the stigma of owning of a reptile has changed from you know Way back when you own a snake, you must be a, a motorcycle gang person, right? Now it's like you own a snake. And, oh, that's really cool. I mean, I think a lot of that changed in the early 90s when Jurassic Park came out. Think about all of the pet stores that opened up selling dinosaurs and then the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So all of a sudden they went from being these, these bad animals to, hey, it's really cool to have one. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'm curious, Doug, about you know, you, you'd mentioned when you got into it, there was basically three books written on the subject. And, and you obviously have one of these founding texts in reptile medicine. It's it's a really important text and it's continued to carry on and, and carry your name throughout the uh, the decades at this point. I'm, I'm so curious about the writing process. How, a, how did you decide I'm going to jump into this initially? And, and then just tell us a little bit about the undertaking that sure. is. Well, uh, let's uh, step back a minute to my, my colleague, Dr. Fred Fry, that I met. He had written um, it was a Dr. Cooper from England, uh, Dr. Marcus, who was actually a veterinarian, and he decided after he went to vet school that he went back and went to medical school. So he's a veterinarian and an MD, and his specialty was tropical medicine and infectious disease. And he always raised reptiles as a kid. So again, there's that connection that we all have. And so he wrote a book mostly focusing on reptile diseases that were transmissible to humans. And then Fred Fry came along and he wrote the first book called Biomedical and Surgical Aspects of Reptile Medicine and Husbandry, big long title. Um, after we became friends, he so he had written that one, then he wrote a, wrote a second book. And then when I met him, he was in the process of writing his last big volume. And he had always written the books by himself. As I mentioned before, a lot of his texts, pretty much all the previous textbooks were all anecdotal. It was like, this is what I saw in practice, and, and here's what I did, here's what worked, here's what didn't work. So as I mentioned also that I had just finished this master's thesis on pharmacokinetics in reptiles, which meant that at the time I had read every single possible paper in any veterinary tomb or uh, herpetology book or journal um, about drugs and reptiles. So for a try, it came to me and he said, hey, listen, I'm finishing up my new book. And he goes, how would you like to write a chapter on drugs, drug therapy and reptiles for me? And I'm like, 
oh my God, really? You want me to write a chapter for you? And he said, yes, I would love it. So I did. So I wrote the chapter for him, which put my name in this amazing man's textbook. And now all of a sudden I had a reputation like overnight. And that's where it started. So once I did that, he decided he wasn't going to do any more book writing. Um, Elsevier, Elsevier, which at the time was W.B. Saunders, came to me at one of my, I was speaking at one of the big meetings and they came to me and they said, hey, we'd really love it if you would write a textbook now that Fred Fry is retired. And I said, well, I don't, I'm not smart like Fred Fry. I, I can't write a book. And he goes, well, we, we think you can. And I said, okay. I says, well, I'll tell you what. Um, if I do it, I would like to reach out and bring in other experts. So I would be the main editor and I'll write the bulk of the chapters, but I want a nutritionist. I want a virologist. I want a dermatologist, an ophthalmologist, a cardiologist. And they said, Hey, that sounds great. And so that's basically how that book, the very first book, the black book, the first mater, which came out in the mid, can't remember, mid nineties. Ninety six, um, I think. Yeah. Thank you. And so I reached out to all these experts, including Michael Taylor. We had talked about him earlier. And uh, I said, listen, I need you to write a chapter on this particular specialty that you are so good at. And they did. And so I don't remember how many authors I had in the first book, but it took about a year to get everybody to contribute their chapters. And they had all they were all the top in their field and their, you know, again, cardiology, oncology, whatever it may be. And at the time, there weren't specialists like there are now. Um, but I did bring in all the experts and an expert is just somebody who's got a ton of experience with it as opposed to a specialist, which has gone jump through all the hoops to take all the tests. So I brought in all these experts that contributed to the first book and, and that's basically how it got started. That's amazing. About yeah. a year. Yeah. I mean, and that's one thing I think is so important about that story too, is just starting with the the Fred Fry books, the anecdotal information. And this is actually something that Kelsey and I talk about all the time is we're in a weird point in our society where people don't believe things unless it's peer reviewed evidence. And without we're sort of forgetting how important anecdotal observation is. And that's where you start. You have to start there. Or, right. you, know, you can't not start there. So it, it's just interesting to hear that evolution start there. Now we're at this, you know, more of a, you know, concrete textbook, but using your eyes and, and, and writing down what you're seeing is just so crucial to even the scientific method. And now I see it all the time on Facebook. I don't believe that unless like, where's the peer reviewed paper? It's like, well, why don't we take a look at, you know, this is what I did in my animal's enclosure. And this is the behavior I saw. I, at least I can use that as a data point. It's not garbage unless it, you know, it hasn't gone through the white paper process. It's just, so that's, it's kind of fascinating to hear that evolution of, of the information. That's where science always starts. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Doug. No, no, go ahead. I, I feel like that's where science always starts. It starts with an observation. It starts with the curiosity and a curiosity is your anecdotal information. And then from there, you can develop a hypothesis and you can do studies based on that. But if you didn't have that initial curiosity based on just what you've seen through your own eyes, then science would probably go nowhere. So I think, and that's a, an important point too. And I, in your in your book as well, Doug, the vet at Noah's Ark, there was a lot of personal stories about clients that have seen things in their animals and they know a lot about their own species. And I feel like you did a really good job of portraying what a good vet does is we have so much that we know and it's our job to give them what we know based on studies, based on things that we've learned and based on our own experience that may not be published yet, but their experience matters and what they know about their animals matters too. And you're always going to learn more by talking to people that like, they, they really believe something's wrong with their animal. And I just, I know with, with experience now that you can't discount that anecdotal information that they're giving you. No, I absolutely 100% agree. I think I think being a doctor and taking care of patients and clients is a team sport. You know, you're not going to do it all by yourself. Um, I think you have to to be open and receptive and listen to what they have to say, as well as look at your patient, take all the data and put it together. And that's how you're going to come up with your best chance for diagnosis. But Dylan, if I could get back to one of your points, and that is... Um, just because something is peer reviewed does not necessarily mean it's accurate. Um, mm -hmm. our, our, the hospital, I, I, I've recently retired from daily practice, but I had a private practice referral hospital and we did rounds twice a day. And then every month we had journal club. And part of the journal club was so that I could teach my visiting students and my young doctors how to properly read a journal article and assess it. Because just because it went through peer review and just because it's in print doesn't always mean it's right. And I'll give you a quick reptile example. Several years ago, there was a study that was 
printed in one of the bigger journals that talked about using a pain medication in ball pythons. And what they did is they wanted to measure uh, cortisol levels pre-surgery and then cortisol levels post-surgery. Half the group got a pain medication, half the group didn't get pain medicine, they got a sham. And then they measured cortisol levels to compare it. And after it was all said and done, they compared the sham group with the pain group, there were no difference in cortisol levels. And they published this paper and they said this particular drug doesn't work. Kelsey, I don't know if you're familiar with cortisol levels in snakes, but snakes don't make cortisol. They make <laughs> corticosterone. So of course, if you measure something that's not there, there's going to be no difference in either group. And somehow that made it all the way through the peer review process. It got put into print and now it's out there. And I still see that paper cited and quoted by other people that don't know the difference or the fact that snakes don't make cortisol. So just because it's in print doesn't necessarily mean that it's gospel. So you, you do have to look at everything and evaluate everything and make sure that it's correct. And yeah. then, you know, let's, let's also look at the big picture too. You have a Fred Fry who was a veterinarian for 50 years. Maybe he never published his, uh, his, uh, responses of, uh, bearded dragons to um, an antibiotic called Batrol, okay? But he's been doing it for 50 years. That's an exaggeration. I'm using this as an example, as opposed to the resident who is required to do a resident project program or a resident project and has six bearded dragons in the laboratory and they give Batrol and they came up with a result based on six bearded dragons in a laboratory in Canada, as opposed to somebody in private practice who's seen hundreds, if not thousands of bearded dragons over 40 years. So which do you think really carries more weight? So you have to look at the whole picture and look at all of the data and all the facts. A hundred percent. I mean, that, and you, a nice way of communicating with clients too in the exam room is that we have to be aware of where we got our information from and, um, and where we think that our, our knowledge deficits are. I think that's a really good thing about any, any professional is knowing where your deficits are. We know what we do know, but we also have to know what we don't know. Um, I love and- that saying. I love that saying. <laughs> it's one of my favorite sayings is, I, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but you oh, nailed man. it, man. I feel like I know less now than I did when I first started. Yeah. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And that scares the heck out of me. <laughs> I think it's exciting, but it is a bit terrifying in, in some sense. I, it makes me... I'm better at communicating with clients now, being very honest about what we do and what we don't know. Um, and also being honest with them about these are the studies that we know, but this was maybe done by the company that made this drug. So we do have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, but it's funny how a telephone tag kind of game gets played with this epistemological worries about where do we get this knowledge from? How do we know now that this this medication might not work for pain in snakes. Now you have to go back to, well, that wasn't the right way to do that study exactly. So now we can learn from that. But now we have to deal with what's come of that where everyone has the same kind of idea and and going back to this idea of where did that come from in the beginning? So I find that really interesting, but it gets frustrating. It's almost like you get into the weeds a bit and you have to pull yourself back out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious just about drugs in general when it comes to treating reptiles. I know that is somewhere that's obviously evolved over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. How, how different, because I, I, my assumption from a layman is that a lot of the drugs were originally mammal drugs that are just trying to, you know, transcribe them over to reptiles. And I know sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it does. Is, is there a future where there's very specific, or maybe it already exists, where this we're creating drugs for specifically for reptiles? Or, or does it, is there, is there close enough biology between mammals and, and reptiles where it doesn't matter? Um, I think that's the Holy grail. And that is everything that's used in, in snakes or any reptile right now is extrapolated from mammalian use. There are, there are, although there are some drugs that have been studied now in reptiles, thank heavens. Um, there are no drugs that are specifically formulated for reptiles and there are no drugs that are FDA or USDA approved to be used in reptiles. So everything that we use in a reptile is what we call extra or off label. Um, and then why? Because again, it's a money thing. Um, you've heard of the, the drug Batril, I'm sure. I think everybody has, right? Yeah. Well, that's that's a drug that was studied in, um, it was actually a human drug, it started as a human drug that didn't work. And then they gave it to the veterinary world and it worked in dogs. And so it became a popular drug in dogs. And all the work done in reptile, all the work, for all the animals used, all the doses used in reptiles came from dog doses. Well, over the last 20 years, there have been probably a dozen or so Batril studies in reptiles. 
but there's no way you'd ever find a company that could would spend the money to market a drug specifically for a reptile. So there's just not enough money in it because the R&D involved in bringing a drug to market is millions and millions and millions of dollars. They'd never recoup that. Right. Yeah, we're definitely stuck in kind of like a limbo almost and just sort of right. having to, to test with our own animals. Kelsey, right. do you have anything to add to that? But I mean, the drug thing is interesting. There's a lot of drugs that we end up using because of anecdotal and personal information and experience that we keep using. There's a, an antibiotic called cefcazidine that we use a lot in reptiles as well. And there are actually very few what are called PKPD studies, so pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic studies that look at where the drug goes in the body, to which tissues, where it concentrates in, and how it kind of works. Um, so we we use doses and we kind of use use them across reptile species. But there, since there's so many different species of reptiles, not to mention within that breeds or morphs, um, and those can react very differently in dogs. Like there are breeds of dogs that certain um, drugs will be fatal for a certain breed of dog. So there's so just so much that we so many branches that we can go. It's so many places we can go in terms of reptile medicine. That I, that's an exciting place where we don't have that much knowledge, but we do have a lot more than we used to have. But yeah, the the drug thing. Um, sometimes you think something's going to work and it just doesn't. And it's really, really frustrating. And so I think we're all just waiting for more knowledge, but we all have to do it together. And it takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Dylan, you asked a question that I, I didn't directly answer. And that was about using drugs for mammals in, in reptiles. And does it just cross over? And, and the answer is, we don't know in all the cases. You know, in a few cases, we've done some studies and we're able to adapt uh, dosages. But just to bring up a point, there's a, a medication called Convenia, which is um, Sofobacin. Do you have that in Canada? We do, yes. It's a long-acting drug that they use in dogs and cats. and It's an antibiotic and one injection, for instance, in a cat can last 10 to 12 days. So you would think, wow, if it lasts 10 to 12 days in a cat, it's going to have to last a month in a reptile, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, interestingly enough, they've given it to iguanas. And Dylan, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but take a guess how long you think it lasts. I just want to take a short break from today's episode to thank each and every one of you for tuning in today. If you would like to show more support for the podcast, you can do that by checking out the show's sponsor, Custom Reptile Habitats. There is an affiliate link in both the YouTube description and the show notes. If you do make a purchase through that link, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. The other way you can show support to the podcast is through the Patreon account. For as little as 75 cents per episode, you will automatically be added to the Discord server so you can communicate and chat with other like-minded keepers. If you do bump yourself up to the $5 a month tier, you'll have early access to the episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Again, I am so grateful for each and every one of you. This podcast is a lot of work and costs me a lot of money each month to run, and any support coming from your end is greatly appreciated. Back to the episode. I don't know. I'm guessing it's short, but is it just a couple of days or? Four hours. Wow. Yeah. So that's a pretty clear example of how you can't necessarily compare apples to apples because it's apples to oranges. So this is just a totally different, to just a totally different ability to or to, to metabolize. It's, that particular drug is, is, is maintained in its long acting form because of certain proteins in the blood of the dogs and the cats. Reptiles don't have those proteins. So without those proteins, the blood doesn't stick or the drug doesn't stick around. Gotcha. There's another antibiotic we use as well called ceftiafir. And there was a study, I think it was in 2017, 2018, maybe, um, on ceftiafir and bearded dragons. And it's um, a drug that we use much more frequently in other species. Like we'll use it in rabbits, maybe every three to five days. But they did an actual, like that study I mentioned, the PKPD study in bearded dragons. And it lasts 12 days, it seems. So there's, and you can't just say that, well, this antibiotic, take convenia, for example, lasts less long in reptiles. So we'd think that maybe safety of fear would also last less long. That's the opposite. So there's just so much unknown. Wow. Yeah, that, <laughs> that makes it confusing. Does, does, do you guys think that reptile medicine, and this is probably a question for both of you, it is getting to a point where subspecialties will be more prominent, like a cardiologist for a, like an exotic or a reptile vet? or oncologist or, or you know some we we sort of see some of that in cat and dog medicine and obviously human medicine but is there a place for that in, in reptile medicine in the next two decades we'll say i don't know that they'll actually have designated subspecialties but we're definitely seeing people pursue areas of special interest um, a classic example would be dr lionel schilliger out of france and he's boarded in reptile medicine in europe um and he loves cardiology. 
So he focuses a lot of his work in cardiology and reptiles, and he's published some very nice papers and review articles on reptile cardiology. And he's done a great job now, um, because it's still in its early stages, of just descriptive reptile cardiology. For example, what I mean by that is ultrasound. So he's done several really nice papers where he's just done amazing ultrasounds on various species of reptiles, published the images, done diagrams, so that now if Kelsey or I were to pick up an ultrasound probe and put it on a snake, and I go, oh, what am I looking at? Well, I can pick up one of Dr. Schilliger's papers and say, oh, well, that's the, the single ventricle, and there's your um, you know, cavern venosum, there's your, your, uh, you know, your left atrium. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there are people that are definitely focusing in certain areas. You know, there's there's a couple of veterinarians in the U.S. that are just really focusing on pain control. Um, there are veterinarians that focus on virology. So, yeah, and I, I think we're seeing that. I don't know if or when there will ever be sub subspecialties, but who knows? Maybe there will. Yeah, yeah, that would be. I could see. I mean, it's still a volume problem, right? You need to have enough animals being mm -hmm. brought to the clinics for this for that to happen. Now, another interesting thing about probably reptile medicine in general, maybe this interesting might not be the right word, is that we know a lot of the animals being brought into clinics are husbandry errors. So it's people bringing them in because they haven't been caring for their animal properly, and and I think this is what one of the issues with because there's so many different species people keep in captivity at this point, from my point of view, I can't expect an exotic vet to understand husbandry for every species that comes through the door. I just don't know how that would be possible, or even if it's even if that's practical. So do you think that husbandry is something that should be, an exotic vet should have their top knowledge on all the time? Or do you think that there's room for like a middleman to educate husbandry so the vets can focus on the medicine and, and, and you know repairing and, and curing animals when they're sick? Well, there's, um, I think of the latest count, there's 13,000 plus species of reptiles. And so it's impossible. I, I'm, Kelsey probably knows them, but I, I am certainly far cry from knowing all 13,000. And, <laughs> but I do think it's imperative that we as exotic animal veterinarians, if you're going to say, I want to start seeing exotics, I want to start seeing reptiles, we know the most common ones. For crying out loud, you need to know your ball python, your python, your your uh, red tail boa, your bearded dragon, your green iguana. I mean, you you got to know the ones that are coming in the door every day. And for the ones that don't come in the door, I think it's also ethical and imperative that you tell the client, I have never seen a rainbow agama before, but hey, let's turn around and look it up. And then you turn with the client there and you, you know, go on the internet, do a search, figure it out, or ask the client, what do you know about this that you can share with me? Mm -hmm. I can certainly cut, sew up this suture, this cut that your snake has, but I don't know if there's anything special we need to know about anesthesia. Or I call another reptile person who's an expert and say, hey, Kelsey, you know, I've got blah, blah, blah here. Can you help me out? What do you think? Have you seen these before? And that's one of the nice things that, that I have found in veterinary medicine is that we're all in it for the same good. And I've never had anybody that I've asked for help say, I'm not going to help you. You know, everybody wants to help each other. Whenever you call me, I'm always happy to help. So I, that's the nice thing about our profession is that it's full of good people. It certainly is. I mean, just with all the vets around, when you feel like you meet a vet and you have that instant bond of you've gone through the similar things, all this mm -hmm. knowledge you've had to try and pack into your brain. But even in the herpeticultural society or like us as reptile vets or amphibian vets, the wacky and the wild exotic vets, even, I feel like this, the community gets even smaller and gets even tighter to the point where it's really nice that I can text message people that have edited textbooks now. I can text message the person that Say it's Sean Perry, who does the Therial Genealogy section of the last edition of Mater. It's like, it's super helpful to be able to get their, again, anecdotal sometimes point of view. And one thing that I remember making me think I really wanted to stay in exotics, I always kind of knew, but I'd ask someone, oh, what do you think about this? I found this. Like, what have you seen? And they said, I've never seen that before. Good luck. Tell me what happens. And I thought, that's fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you get the opportunity to uh, blaze the path and blaze the trail a little bit. And yeah. sort of flipping this concept of, of this, this figuring out how to treat reptiles and, and, and do reptile medicine in general on its head, there's also, you know, Doug, you kind of alluded to it with the different metabolizing, and how, how these animals will metabolize medications differently and whatnot. There's some fascinating things about just the physiology of reptiles. And, and in some cases, we've actually been able to apply that to humans. The most obvious one is venom, you know, studying venom research and using that as medications and whatnot. 
when you look at a reptile, they have an incredible ability. To, they have a lot of them are incredible long living. They have uh, slow meta- slow metabolisms or fast metabolisms. They have the ability to shut their bodies down for incredible uh, lengths of time. Do you guys think that there's any areas where we can start pulling some of that information into human medicine or, or more areas that, because they're just these ama- amazing creatures. I mean, we talk about how long they can suffer for and how stoic they are. Is that, I think that's a, a quote from Kelsey you had when we had you on the podcast originally. You talked about how stoic reptiles are and how their ability to endure pain and things along those lines. Is there more room for pulling from reptiles into human medicine? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll give you a really classic example. You take your, um, your leopard gecko and maybe the kid's holding it and he's really rough with it and the tail falls off. Mm -hmm. What happens? The tail regenerates. So if we can study that process, maybe we can start using that and apply it toward human medicine. So if somebody loses a thumb or an arm or a leg, Maybe someday we'll figure out the genetics behind how does that leopard gecko regenerate its limb? Can we apply that to humans? One case that I will never, ever, ever forget, and I don't know if this will, anything will ever come of it, but it's something that just left an impression on me, was I had a box turtle that was hit by a lawnmower, and it literally evolves the central third of its spinal cord. Okay. I mean, if you picture, there's the head, there's the shoulders, there's the spine, there's the hips, there's the tail, take the center of the spine and just throw it away. So you have the head, the shoulders, a little bit of spine, big blank, a little bit of spine, hips and a tail. Okay. Mm-hmm. I treated that animal, treated the wound. The beauty of reptiles is that they have something called spinal ganglia. So their back feet don't need to talk to their brain in order to work. So it's basically all a reflex mechanism. So an animal that's missing the center of its spine, if it's alive, will still walk. It just the front feet will go sometimes in one direction. The back feet may not be in sync with the front feet, but they do fine. They can still urinate. They can still defecate. So the owner didn't want to give up. So we treated this animal, treated the wounds. I covered the area. Um, and this was way back when, when I used to use patches over shell deficits. I don't do that anymore. So I put a patch over the big section of shell where the spinal cord was missing Fast forward like 10 years, the animal unfortunately passed away. I don't know how old it was, but that thing lived 10 years like that. And I asked the owner, says, I know this is sensitive and delicate. And I says, but we've been on this ride for a long time together. Would you be okay if I respectfully did a necropsy, which is an animal autopsy on your turtle? And I'll do it in such a way that, it, you know, I, I won't damage the shell or anything. And that way you can still go ahead and have his remains back. And the owner says, absolutely, you know, absolutely. You do what you need to do. So I did the necropsis animal and son of a gun. And there's pictures of this in one of my textbooks, the spine regenerated. Wow. The entire spine regenerated. So wouldn't it be cool if we can take that knowledge and help people with spinal cord diseases? Yes, that would be amazing. Axolotls are studied a lot too. And, um, and for, in regards to human medicine and cancers. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's so there a, that's are a amazing. lot of things, Dylan. That's a really great question. There are a lot yeah. of things that hopefully we can extrapolate. And I can't take credit for that question. That's from one of my patrons who who is a doctor. I think he's a pediatrician. Hopefully I'm getting that right. So his obviously his brain is thinking that way. And uh, yeah, I think that that is a fascinating area of study. And it is bizarre to think, I mean, here we are as humans, if our teeth break, it's like, there you go, you're done with your teeth. You don't get them back. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's turtles out there growing their spines back. It's, it's pretty incredible. Right. I, I, you're in Florida, Doug. So you're kind of at the epicenter of reptile regulation. And so I, I wonder what your opinion is on, on, on just regulating our the community in general as far as keeping reptiles, because Florida is a poster child for how things can kind of go wrong as far as invasive species and whatnot. But so some people think we, we, they shouldn't be kept at all. Some people think that there should be some regulation. I don't know what to think because I always think government regulation pretty much never goes as they plan it. So that I'm kind of, I'd be worried about that. But from your point of view, do you think that there needs to be more done as far as regulating how people are keeping the reptiles? I think it's become such a political quagmire right now, Dylan, that I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's very distressing for me as a person who loves reptiles and values their importance in the human animal bond. Um, as with most anything, it's, I think it's definitely the small majority or small minority of people that are 
irresponsible that are causing the vast majority of the problems. And you could extend that to, let's say, pit bulls. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love pit bulls. They're great dogs. I have one, but they have a bad rap because the very few people that are irresponsible in how they own them, it makes the dog breed look bad. So it's the same thing with reptiles. You get the occasional moron idiot who decides to let their black and white tegu loose in the Everglades and look at the problems it makes. Mm -hmm. So I, I do agree with some regulation. I think that's extremely important, but they've gone too far in the state of Florida in my mind, whereas you can't own a green iguana, you can't own a tegu, you can't own a Burmese python. And why is that fair? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yes, these are potentially troublesome animals, but at the same time, you can make the argument that never let your cat outside because it's going to eat the wild birds. Never let your dog loose because it's going to attack the local skunk. You know, it's so I do think at least in the state of Florida, they've gone too far, but it's all being motivated by politics, not by scientific reason. Yeah, 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 that's definitely true. Kelsey, do you have anything to add to that? It's the same thing. I mean, in, in Alberta, we... Uh, rats are legal in mm. BC and they're also legal in Saskatchewan, but they don't cross the border. I guess they stop at the border. Uh, and I get the, I get the reasons politically farming. I totally understand, but I mean, I love seeing rats. I don't get to see them in practice. There's lots of reptiles that we can't have here as well. Lots of different animals. And I totally agree with Doug. I guess I just basically reiterate that there's, I understand the need for regulation. I do think there should be some, but there, uh, it's a good thing that we have societies to try and push back and to try and bring light to, you know, there's, there's, there's a human animal bond here between all these different species and we want to foster that and they, and they can get proper care. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, but that is kind of how society works in terms of, balancing freedoms and balancing safety for everybody um that it's it's unfortunate now that i feel like governments i don't know if there's been a slow trend towards this but i, I sometimes i feel a little bit less listened to i feel like i can get on boards and deal with um herpetoculture societies and i just don't feel like there's an actual give and take relationship in terms of government oversight and what the people want to talk about mm -hmm. and i feel like that's a big disconnect i feel like there's so much to learn from each other and so much to help and so much to um, we could help the governments do things that actually make the people happy, but that make everybody happy on both sides. And I feel like that open discussion is really important and I miss that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Doug, let's talk a little bit about your new, your latest book, The Vet at, at Noah's Ark. And maybe you could just start with, tell us about what, what motivated you to write it. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've written three textbooks uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. And that was a labor of love to be, give back to and share with my colleagues. Um, but ever since high school, when I was working with the veterinarian and he gave me the first copy of James Harriet, I said, you know, two things I want to do in life. One is I want to be a James Harriet. And the other one is I want to write a book because I, I mentioned, I loved to read when I was growing up and I still do. And when I read his books and he is such an amazing storyteller and I said, you know, someday I want to do that. And so even back in high school, I started taking creative writing classes, and I've always been a writer. My teacher in high school said, if you want to be a writer someday, you need to keep a journal. You have to write at least one page a day. And so I've pretty much done that. And, you know, there may be a three or four days or a week that goes by that I don't get a chance to write, but then I'll sit down and I'll write six or seven pages. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've always kept journals. I've always been writing. The other thing this person told me was, if you can't call yourself a writer until you've published a million words. Well, fortunately, I've, I've probably done that two or three times over now. But when I finally decided to retire from general practice, I still have a small boutique practice. I've got some uh, facilities like alligator farms and you know zoos and aquariums that I take care of. I don't do private clients anymore. That is okay. It's time for me to start writing. So I finally sat down, pulled out all my old journal notes, and. Uh, started penning the book and uh you know i was motivated by james harriet so that's that's what got it started did you um, find doug that when you were um writing in your journals that you're mostly writing stories of the day or were you writing like you get up and just get whatever comes out conscious flow kind of writing or how were you writing uh before? no uh cases okay I, I kept a really good detail on most of my cases because i knew someday they'd come in handy and it's interesting how i go back and we were talking earlier about anecdotal and I think, you know, I've never seen that published, but wait a minute. And I'll dig through some of my notes mm. and I go, yeah, you know, I saw a case of this and this is how I treated it. Oh, it died. But I learned. Okay. Yes. This is what didn't work. And sometimes what doesn't work is just as important as what does work. Yes. But by doing that, you know, all of those cases, and, if, you know, you, you said you read my book, you know, all those cases came with an owner. 
or a situation. And so it made it real easy for me to put together the facts in the book because everything in the book is 100% real with the exception I changed names for privacy sakes for a lot of people. But it's all real, and it, and I was able to have that documentation because I kept all those notes over the years in all so many cases. And, and then, in all honesty, too, every once in a while I'd have a client that would come in that was so bizarre, I'd have to write about them just so that I didn't want to forget all the details. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's honestly a, such a good tip for people just in life is to to spend some time journaling and writing just writing whether it's you know like Kelsey said just writing out the day or conscious flow whatever it is or because a you can go back on these things and who knows what kind of gold you have written down over the years like you that you basically wrote a book with that sort of thing but just for your mind I think it's good to get stuff out on paper and just just write and so so for for those who haven't read the book can you tell us just a little bit about the just the general story sure absolutely um the books the book occurs over the period of one year and it so happens to be the year that i decided to sit for and take my specialty boards from the american board of veterinary practitioners and at the time it was called companion animal practice uh no longer now it's called dog and cat but at the time it was called companion animal practice and the reason i wanted to do that was because i was actively writing in journal articles and doing a lot of lecturing and everything else, but it was just Doug Mater, MS, DVM, no specialties. And I noticed when I'd go to these different conferences and bless their souls, you know, you, you would be speaking on programs with these amazing veterinarians, Birchards and Shirtings and people like that. And that were, you know, single boarded, double boarded. And, and if you didn't have boards, they didn't really give you the time of day. They didn't give you any credit of having any knowledge base. But keep in mind, I had just finished a primate center residency where I was taught by MDs. I went to rounds at the medical school. I was taught my surgery skills by human surgeons. I was taught my endoscopy skills, my, my cardiology skills. Everything that I learned at the primate center was through the medical school, not the veterinary school. So I, could, I always felt that I had a pretty strong background in training and skill sets and knowledge base, but nobody cared because I wasn't boarded. So I said, okay, I want to get boarded. And they didn't have a board in exotic animals at the time. So I want to get boarded. So I have credentials to go along with my teaching in exotic animals. So the book basically is about the year that I studied for it. And I know that sounds really boring, but that was just the backstory. The book is really about the human animal bond. And it's a celebration of the human animal bond across many different species. And it's a celebration of dedication by the people that worked with me in my hospital and how it's just amazingly conscientious and dedicated they were toward preserving that human animal bond to the point where they would put the physical self in harm's way. I had one, I don't want to give away names or be a plot spoiler, but I had one of my staff members was stabbed. Uh, you know, we had a client that was killed. Um, I mean, there was some pretty significant drama living in the inner city because it happened to overlap at the same time of the social unrest during the Rodney King riots. And so it was pretty rough. And my staff, I, they were just so brave that they, in, in, even in spite of everything that was going on that was so horrible, they still showed up for work every day and still took care of all of these animals. So the course of the book starts with me basically submitting my application and it ends with me getting notification that I passed the test. And again, it was just all the day-to-day -day trauma and drama of what goes on inside a busy inner city hospital during that time. So it's filled with a lot of anecdotes. Uh, a lot of really happy anecdotes, but it's a real book. So there are some sad anecdotes in there because as we all know, not every case turns out well. Um, but I think overall, it, it's a pretty enjoyable read. I'm humbled. It's it's won three really amazing awards, the biggest of which was the 2023 Independent Book Award, the winner for nonfiction, which just blew me out of the water. Um, it's been likened by a lot of critics as the first American James Harriet. Um, and made New York Post uh, required reading lists. So I've been super thrilled at the response it's gotten. That's great. Just thank you so much for writing this book. I We had talked earlier about how I'm a clinic owner in, in Alberta, and um, a lot of these stories resonate with, with me, but they would have also resonated with me before I became a vet. 
Um, and they will resonate with anyone who's ever had an animal or really anyone who just lives and understands that there's other creatures that are alive that we're all living together for. I, um, it was not an easy read in terms of it's simple, but it was so easy for me to in intake all of it. It was one of those books where you, when you, when you get to like that hour mark of sitting in the same spot, you can keep going for the next couple hours. So I do recommend that anybody take this book up and read it, whether you're a vet or not a vet. Um, one part I wanted to ask you about, you lift the veil a little bit in there, and I can't tell if it's just because of who we are as vets or if, we, if it was purposeful. Lift the veil on what it's like to actually be a vet in your private life. So you were talking about how you and your wife were kind of ships passing in the night, how um, there were lots of things that you took solace in, like going for walks with your dog, um, because being a vet is, is is a hard, it's a hard job. What 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 are your thoughts on how vet life has changed because you had people living at the hospital back then like your whole life was was being a vet i feel like sometimes there may be a shift towards being a vet is just a career for some people and no longer our lives do you feel that in how society has changed over the last 10 20 years i do think so and you know this is a great subject for another podcast down the road but i you know for me being a veterinarian is a lifestyle it was something i wanted to i wanted to live and and i have lived that and um, that's always been extremely important to me. It's not a nine to five job. Um, you know, you always hear this term work life balance. And I think that's extremely important and you need to take care of your mental health and, and you, you nailed it. Um, you know, my, my wife was a emergency room nurse and she loved the adrenaline of being an emergency room nurse and she worked the graveyard shift. And I did my apply applied my in my, my job during the day. So pretty much, you know, I'd be driving home and I'd wave out the car as she was driving past on her way to work. And we were lucky if we would get, you know, one or two days off a month where we had the same time off together. And so my dog was my best friend. And, you know, at night I would take him for his walks and we would go to the park and then I would talk to him and he would always listen. My best friend, because he never passed judgment. He never criticized me. He was always there for me. He was my bodyguard because it was a pretty crappy part of town where we lived. And, you know, I, I always joke that if you're carrying a gun underneath your coat and you walk down the street, nobody knows you have it. And they're going to come up and give you a hard time until you pull the gun out. If you're walking down the street with a big black dog, everybody gets off the curb and gives you birth because they don't go near near you. So like I said, he was my best friend, my confidant, my bodyguard, and uh, the human animal bond was strong, you know, and, and, and uh, you're right. But getting back to the work-life balance thing, I love what I do. 40 years into this, I still love what I do. And so to me, going to work is not work. I love what I do. And I love helping people. And I love promoting that human-animal bond. And if I can save an animal and keep that bond going strong, I'm doing the happy dance all the way home. Um, I don't need to take trips to India and I don't, you know, and that kind of stuff. To, to me, that's not important. Um, now that I've retired, um, I've always owned my money, and I think that's extremely important because everybody worries about debt and student debt and stuff like that. But you can either have money or you can own your money. And if you own your money, means you make the money work for you. So all throughout my career, I've been very careful about investments and doing things properly. Now that I'm retired, I have my work-life balance. If I want to go to India, I go to India, but I fly first class. You know, <laughs> I don't need to sit in the back of the bus and stay in hostels. Um so my work-life balance is here. I'm perfectly happy and I wouldn't change a thing how I did it, but that's not the way a lot of the younger vets are trained nowadays. But to me, veterinary medicine for me was always a, a calling, you know, it was a lifestyle. Yeah. And one more follow-up question to that. You had a story in your book about a student that wasn't, it wasn't going very well. It, she didn't seem like she was trying very hard. Um, like she was really interested. Do you find that happens more nowadays? And I, my anecdote is I see that a little bit more nowadays because um, I now train students that come through my veterinary hospital. And it just seems like there isn't that. I don't know if the passion is gone or if just life has gotten harder or it, is that something that you think is happening more nowadays? <clears throat> I do. And I think it's being taught that way too. I, I, um, or, I mean, right before I retired, uh, I always, I've always had students for as long as I can remember. And I remember before I retired the last couple of years when the students would come out with their paperwork, I would frequently get these uh, instructions from their schools that Sally or Joe or whoever, uh, they need to do eight to five. They shouldn't be expected to come in after five. They shouldn't be expected to do emergencies. If I notice that they're stressed, I should give them time off to 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 regroup and calm down. And I'm thinking, 
I'm sorry. You know, if the client's upset, if a pet is dying at a quarter to five, I'm not going home at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. I'm staying there until that pet is stable and I can hand it off to an emergency doctor or the next shift. You know, I don't quit at the end of the day just because I'm tired. And I definitely see that they're taught a different framework than at least I was taught when I was coming up. Yeah. Yeah. I see that as well. And I, I get, I think the underpinnings um, idea for that is, is a good one. I think that they want to make sure that everyone is being, is okay. But I worry that with the coddling of that, that we might create um, people that are less able to deal with what stresses that veterinary medicine does actually bring. Cause my goodness, like you get bombarded with things every day, all day. And then if you be an owner, or even if you're just working in a clinic, there's also the people personalities to deal with the inter-hospital kind of stuff. So I agree. I think, yeah. I think it's nice to, to control it so we can minimize the stress, but you also have to be trained to handle it when it's there. And I think one of the words I use a lot is being prepared. Right. You know, I live in a hurricane prone area. I can't stop hurricanes. I know they're out there, but if I'm prepared, I'm going to be able to handle them much better than if I'm not prepared. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's about slowly being being able to handle more and more stress over time. And and if you wanted to just pretend that hurricanes don't happen, then uh, when the hurricane does come, you'll be standing in your living room and there'll be no living room, <laughs> you know? Yes. So, and, and maybe some of those individuals t- maybe shouldn't go into veterinary medicine if they do, if they can't handle that stress, that, that could be, an, you know, another side of it as well. And, and I'm curious, you know, vet, vet burnout is a, is a pretty prominent term. People hear that vet burnout or compassion fatigue. Doug, you've been a vet for how how long has it been? God, almost 40 years. 40 years. So how, how do you avoid that? Or, or how do you, you know, bolster yourself against falling into the ditch of, of compassion fatigue and whatnot? I think the real important thing is, is to number one, admit that it's going to happen. Okay. Everybody is susceptible to it. Um, if you deny it, then when it happens, you're really going to be in for a shock. The other thing is surround yourself with a good support network. Um, I can, you know, I, I I can tell you right now that I have a feeling that if I ever needed something, I could call you and you'd pick up the phone or I could call Kelsey. And likewise, if you needed something, you could call me anytime. You surround yourself with a good support network. And then if you needed to it, you can lean on them. But likewise, they know that if they need you, they can lean on you. And if you have that support network set up and established, and you're aware of the fact that someday you may need it, and don't be afraid and don't be ashamed if you ever need to ask for help, it's okay. You know, I mean, everybody has things go wrong. Everything, everybody has a bad day and it's nothing to be ashamed of. If you have to say, God, Dylan, you know, this client's really upset with me because I gave their bearded dragon ivermectin and it died, you know, you know, it's even if you don't know what to do, the fact that you can sit there and listen to me and help me get it off my chest, man, it makes all the difference in the world. And so again, having a really good support network and being there for your friends and they're there for you. Um, it really makes all the difference. It really does. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I think that there's there's ways you can spend your time. You can spend your time being worried about money or being worried about status. And I've always thought that spending your time building a relationship with people is going to help you the most. Because at the end of the day, who knows what's going to happen financially? Who knows what's going to happen with the world? But if you have spent that time building really good relationships and being there for people, then they can be there for you. It's like building a, a community. I think that really matters. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's so true. And, and and that's what's great about the book is you kind of get some insight on what it's like to have those hard days and be exhausted and, and have to, you know, still show up for your clients. And, and I, but I think highlighting the human animal bond is so important, especially right now, as you know, I kind of alluded to earlier, we're having pressure from animal rights groups and whatnot that, you know, people shouldn't keep exotics, for example, where a lot of times people who, who aren't in our community don't see how there could be a human animal bond between me and a snake. And, the, and I think that's, what's great about the book as well. You highlight these examples of people who, how important a, a pet snake can be to somebody, you know, it is so people who don't keep snakes might not understand, but it can be just as important as, uh, as your dog and, and people, and, and that will allow us to sort of build a more of a respect for people who have a human animal bond with an animal that isn't one of the conventional pets, you know, cat or dog. Yeah, I, I I don't know that we can put a label on the human animal bond and say it's only for cats, dogs, and horses because it crosses species. And again, a quick personal example. Um I adopted a, a California desert tortoise when I was a student, a veterinary student. And so you can, you know, that that was a long time ago. 
and I'd had it, it, and I'd estimated it was about 57 years old, and I think I had it for about 35 years. So that animal was part of my life for 35 years. Every day for 35 years, I'd get up. I, Where I live, I, I bring them to a bedroom at night, and I take them out during the day. Um, I feed it. I water it. I clean it. Um, and eventually, it ended up getting liver cancer. And so I did the endoscopy on it. I saw it. I took biopsies on it. I just about died, Um, got the results back, came back cancer, and I didn't want to let him suffer. So I gave him hospice care until he was no longer comfortable and I had to put him down. I was a mess, absolute mess. I mean, how do you have something in your life for 35 years and all of a sudden it's not there anymore, Mm -hmm. you know, and think that it's not going to affect you? So, you know, people have dogs and cats for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. That's a long time have something for 35 years. And I know people who have, I, I have clients that have tortoises that have been in their family for over a hundred years, documented, passed down from grandfather to father to son. And how can you not have a bond with something like that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think about even my crested gecko, he was, he hatched in 05 and I ha- I bought him in 07, you know, so I've had him for, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's an incredible amount of time. And I was just saying that to my wife the other day. I'm like, isn't it crazy for the past basically 15 or 16, 17 years, I have fed this animal, you know, every couple of days. Like it's just, it just becomes part of your routine that you don't even realize mm-hmm. you're doing it, but you're caring for this animal. It's like, yeah, I, I go back to being in grade 11 and that's when I got that animal. And I'm not, you know, now I have a child of my own and I have a career. It's, it's just, it's crazy how, and that's the special thing about reptiles is so many of them are so long lived that they come along with your entire journey of your life. Or yeah. like you said, a dog might only live 10 years. You know, it's still an amazing pet, an amazing bond you can have, but a reptile will really span right through your entire journey, which is really cool. Yeah. Well, I give you an idea how important they are, at least in my life, is my wife and I were considering moving um, and just recently. And we have we still have three tortoises, and two of them have had more than 30 years. And where we wanted to go, it wouldn't be an appropriate environment for the tortoises. Well, this particular house had a huge basement. So yeah, I could set up a vivarium and I could put in UV lights and sand and dirt and sod and everything else. But these guys have lived outside for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we go, we can't make these animals live indoors and we're not going to give them away. I'm not going to give them what's like, say you you, with your, you said you have a child. So you're going to go, oh, I want to move, but inconvenient to have kids. So I'll just give them away. No. So (laughs) we said, okay, we're not going to move. We're going to stay here. We're going to keep the tortoises. We're going to stay right where we are. I mean- that's how important they are to us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's definitely many reptile keepers out there who, when they're looking to buying a new house, the first thing is, okay, where would the reptiles go? And if this house <laughs> mm-hmm. doesn't have a good appropriate reptile room, it's like it's off the list. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That totally well, makes sense. This was a fantastic conversation, Doug. I'm so happy you wrote that book. Like you said, I think it's obviously more accessible to people than a veterinary textbook because you'd be surprised how many of the listeners actually have a version or an edition of the textbook. But but that's not, the, you know, it's, you want to have some interesting reading where you can sit down and, and really absorb a story. And I think that's what your, your latest book does. Is there any last words from either of you that you want to say before we officially wrap up? No, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you both. And uh, I, I, I absolutely love Canada. I've been up there numerous times lecturing on vacation, doing photography. Uh, The people are always wonderful. And uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, You're very gracious. And I'm always here. If you ever need anything, you can give me a call. And maybe we can carry on one of these other side conversations sometime down the road. 100%. I would love that. Yeah, 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 I'd be so happy to be included in that. Thank you so much, Dylan, for for having me on. And I've uh, met you only briefly, Doug, but it's an honor to be to be allowed to interview you. So this is going to be something I'll remember well, thank for a you long very time. Much. Well, I'm sure we'll run into each other down the road here real soon. I hope yeah, so. Absolutely. And Doug, before we let you go, can you let everybody know where they can pick up the book? Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, you can go amazon.com has it. Amazon Canada has it. Um, you can go right to my website, www.dougmater.com, and you can order it from there through several different vendors. Um, and then a lot of the uh, brick and mortar stores like Barnes and Noble also carry it and you can get it. I don't know if they have them in Canada, Target and Walmart. They both carry this, the book. So it's, it's widely available on the internet. Excellent. All right. Well, Doug, this was an honor and a pleasure to have you on. So thank you so much. Thank you both very much. Take care. And that is the end of that episode. Dr. Mater, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. 
as I said through the intro, you are a staple name in her pediculture community. So it was just fascinating hearing your origin stories and how you've evolved over time and listening to some of that sort of nuances about reptile medicine is just absolutely fantastic. Dr. Kelsey Chapman, thank you so much for jumping on as a co-host. I think this is the first podcast you've probably co-hosted, and uh, I think you crushed it, and it was just so much easier and uh, allowed me to sit back and kind of enjoy some of the podcasts as well, rather than panicking about trying to figure out how I'm going to have a complicated technical conversation with a really well-known vet. I got to just sit back and put the pressure on you to do that. So thank you so much for doing that as well. Listeners, if you did enjoy the episode, make sure you share it on social media, Facebook, Instagram, however you like. I do my best to repost and reshare any of those shares on Instagram, so I, uh, that really does go a long way. If you are interested in helping support the podcast, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. If you would like to know where I got these incredible enclosures behind me, make sure you go check out customreptilehabitats.com. You can find an affiliate link in both the show notes on YouTube or the description on YouTube as well as the show notes on any podcasting app. By the way, if you do not listen to the podcast on YouTube, the podcast is obviously on Spotify and Apple and whatnot, but Spotify does allow for video now. So if you're craving the video and you typically consume the podcast on Spotify, it does show up as video, or I'm sure you already know that if you're a Spotify listener. But if you're not a Spotify listener and you want the video and don't want to be on YouTube, you can do that. Uh, list, watch the video on Spotify. And if you need more information on the podcast, make sure you head to www.animalsathomenetwork.com. I will see you guys in the next episode.